Hello, and welcome to this webinar designed specially for parents and carers about the SCN and Disability Single Route of Redress, the National Trial. My name is Andre Imick. I'm the SEN and Disability Professional Advisor working for the Department for Education. Our aims in creating this webinar are, firstly, we want to set out the exact reasons why we're having this national trial. We also want to spell out what are the duties, the roles and the responsibilities of local authorities and their health body partners. It's very important that by the end of the webinar, you understand as parents and carers the support that's available to you as part of the national trial. We also want to clarify what families can expect if they appeal to the tribunal under this new process. There will also be some details about the guidance and support available and we will be responding to some of the frequently asked questions from parents and carers. Before we introduce this trial, parents and carers could only appeal to the tribunal over the special education aspects of their child's education, health and care plan. If there were worries about health or social care, parents and carers had to take out separate routes of complaints. However, now, under the trial, if there are concerns about the special education sections of a plan, or even about a local authority decision not to issue a plan, parents and carers can go to the tribunal and raise wider concerns they may have about the health or social care aspects of the plan. Because under the new trial, the tribunal now has powers to make non-binding recommendations about the health and social care aspects of education, health and care plans as part of the appeal about special educational aspects. As an overview about the national trial, it is a two year trial expanding the powers of the first tier tribunal to make non-binding recommendations about the health and social care aspects of plans. It's a trial to see whether we need to change the law to make that a permanent feature of our legislation around special educational needs. The power applies to all the local authority education, health and care plan decisions and education, health and care plans issued or amended from the 3rd of April 2018. It applies to every single local authority and every single CCG. In order to pursue a, a, an appeal under the national trial, there has to be an appeal about the educational aspects, the special educational parts of an education, health and care plan in order to be able to ask the tribunal to make recommendations about health or social care aspects. Taking part in the trial does not stop parents from continuing to pursue other routes of complaint. As we've already emphasised, any recommendations arising from an appeal are non-binding in relation to the health and social care aspects. But we do expect them to be generally followed and parents have every right to complain to the Ombudsman or to seek the, the decision to be judicially reviewed if they're not followed. We've also asked Ofsted and CQC to look at the way that local areas are dealing with the new process as part of the SEN and disability local area inspections. And finally, we do need to understand the impact of the national trial, this new process, so we have asked an independent body to undertake evaluation throughout the two years. The, the evaluation will look at any issues arising from how to implement what the issues are for health, social care and education teams in implementing these new processes. 
It's also very important that we evaluate the outcomes on families and agencies to get an understanding of what has happened as a result for the, of the trial for them. And finally, it is important to understand the economics and the cost issues around the whole process. And all of this will feed together to make a recommendation about whether the trial should be continued as a permanent right of appeal. If it was to be continued, it would require legislation uh, in the House of Parliament. The key aims of the national trial include aiming to create a more holistic, person-centred view of the child or young person's needs. This was in part a vision of the Children and Families Act so that the assessment process and the resulting plan was indeed much more holistic in thinking about the child's special education, their health and social care needs, and the provision required to meet those. So we wanted to bring that, uh, we wanted to make sure that the rights of redress were in line with the wider remit of education, health and care plans. These include health and social care provision. So we wanted to give families the chance to appeal about those under one system. We also believe the trial will further encourage joint working between local authorities. That includes both the SEM teams in local authorities and their social care colleagues and the health bodies that work within the local area. We also believe that it will bring about positive benefits to families by giving them a one-stop shop, a single route of redress, a single place to go where they can bring their concerns about an education, health and care plan. And ultimately, we want to explore in a lot of detail with close monitoring whether this new right, this extended right, should actually become a permanent right of appeal under our laws. My name is Maroon Sisoda. I'm one of the co-chairs of the National Network of Parent Care Forums, and we've been involved um, in um, the tribunal trial um, process from the beginning. And, and um, I've been asked to speak a little bit about what are the benefits for national the national trial for families. Well, I think the first benefit is, is clear. It creates a, a one-stop shop, or you know, in, in, in the language of the tribunal, a single route of redress for concerns that families may have around an EHCP plan. The, previously, um, families have had to go through various different routes um, to, to, to get their concerns uh, addressed, and, and, and this offers uh, a a single route, one, one place to go to, to share all of the concerns and really brings together um, the intentions of the Children and Families Act of health, education and social care really being under one roof. Um, previously, um, the, tr the, the, the SEND Tribunal had no powers over the health and social care aspects of a plan. Um, this now changes that. Now, um, there are limitations and I'll talk to those on the next slide. There are some limitations of the National Trial for Families. Um, the first of these is probably that um, this trial is coming in a little bit too late. It would have been nice if we'd had um, some of the provisions that are available to us now from the beginning of the implementation of the Children and Families Act. But nevertheless, we are where we are. Um, when it comes to the real limitations, um, the first is that you must have an educational concern or complaint in order to access um, the SCND tribunal. If you have only a health or social care complaint, then you cannot use this route um, of address. Once you have an educational um, uh, a concern, then uh, health and social care aspects can be taken into account and can be reviewed by this tribunal. The second major area of, of limitation is that the um, the judgments that the SEND tribunal makes about health and social care are non-binding. This means that the law does not require health and social care commissioners to follow the recommendations. Now, on the face of it, that's a major concern. However, um, although the recommendations are non-binding, the, um, the findings of the tribunal um, are severe, are, are serious. Um, and um, local authorities in health would need to be very clear as to why they were not following them if they chose not to. Also, 
the um, local government ombudsman and the parliamentary and health service ombudsman have made it very clear that they will take um, these SEND tribunal judgments very seriously indeed and they cannot be lightly rejected. If the tribunal makes recommendations about health or social care issues, the health or social care body or both must write to the family and the local authority, that's the special education team, within five weeks of the judgment to tell them if they're going to follow those recommendations. Where they are, they must explain the actions they're going to take in following the recommendations. However, if they decide they're not going to follow the tribunal's recommendations, they must explain in writing to the family and the local authority why they're not going to do so. In these instances, where the body has decided not to follow the recommendations, parents and carers can still take their case to the relevant ombudsman and or seek a judicial review. Let's have a look at the types of appeals that parents and carers can make under the single route of redress. In fact, the new rights uh, cover all the rights of appeal around the EHC needs assessment process and a plan, except against the initial decision about whether to assess or not. Parents and carers can still appeal about a local authority's refusal to assess but this decision does not actually bring in health or social care factors, hence the reason it has not been included. When appealing about other aspects, parents and carers must have an issue or a complaint about the special educational aspects. Under the trial, you cannot register an appeal against health or social care issues unless you are appealing about some special educational issues. The tribunal itself also has the power to look at appeals that are being made under the education only uh, route. If they think there are health or social care aspects that really should be considered, then they do have the power to bring in health or social care aspects. And in fact, this power can be made at any point during the whole appeal process. And this is a list of all the decisions that local authorities make, which can be appealed under the single route of redress. So the tribunal can make recommendations about health and social care provision or needs if it's part of an appeal relating to this list of decisions. We'll now have a look at the procedure that parents and carers can expect when they make an appeal to the tribunal. Firstly, let's look at the timescales for an appeal under the national trial. We have set out a process that under normal circumstances will lead to a decision being issued within 14 weeks from the date the appeal is registered. During the first six weeks, once an appeal is received, there is a case management process which identifies the issues, looks at the evidence that may be required if it's not been already um, secured, and it will clarify the types of recommendations that are being asked for. About week seven, we expect the final evidence deadline. And then from week eight to week 10, there is a telephone case management of the appeal, if that is required in the particular appeal. By week 10, an evidence bundle will be produced by the local authority and around week 12, we are expecting that the hearing of the case will be heard. Two weeks later, after the hearing, we expect the decision to be issued by the tribunal. 
At a hearing, there will be a panel that comprises the tribunal with three members. The first is the judge. The second will be a specialist member who has expertise and experience of special educational needs and or disability. And the third member is someone with specialism in health or social care issues. The length of the hearing will be decided during the case management process. Normally, we would expect the hearing to last no more than one day. There may be some exceptions to that. And again, as part of the process, the tribunal will be aiming to look at the educational issues first, then to turn to the health or social care issues that are being considered under the national trial. We're now going to look at the powers of the tribunal. When a tribunal receives an appeal, it has the power to make decisions on special educational issues that are subject to the appeal. Under the single route of redress, it also has the power to make recommendations about social care and health issues. Once the tribunal has reached its decision, it must send the decision in writing, including any recommendations under the single route of redress, to the local authority and to the parent or the young person. The tribunal must also send a copy of any recommendations and the full decision to the relevant health body if it makes any recommendations on health. By sending the decision to the local authority, this will also be reaching the social care teams. Where the outcome is recommendations, the local authority or the clinical commissioning group must give detailed reasons to the parent, carer or young person within five weeks of receiving the decision if they decide not to follow the tribunal's recommendations. If that refusal has an impact on the decision of the tribunal, then either party may request a review of the decision on the basis of a change of circumstance. Parents or young people can challenge the decision not to adopt recommendations. They can challenge this in two ways. They can either make a referral to the local government public services ombudsman, or they can seek a judicial review. The single route of redress has introduced a set of expectations about what we expect from local authorities and their partners. In relation to the roles and responsibilities of local authorities, they must notify parents and young people of this new right, the extended powers of the tribunal, whenever they make any of the decisions that we have already referred to about which parents and carers can appeal. As a reminder, this is the list of decisions that are subject to the extended powers. And therefore, whenever a decision is made about any of these, the local authority must tell parents and young people about the new right of appeal. In addition, local authorities must include information about the national trial in their local offers and links to relevant information where parents can follow up. If they're required to do so, the local authority must provide evidence to the tribunal from the local health and social care bodies in response to any issues raised under an appeal, 
within the time frame that the tribunal requests. And the local authorities can seek permission to bring additional witnesses to the hearing, which they may well do given that the issues are likely to be wider. There are also roles and responsibilities placed upon health and social care commissioners. For example, they too must respond to any request for information and evidence within the time frame set by the tribunal. If required, they must send a representative to, hear, to, the, to attend the tribunal hearing so that they can give oral evidence. Once a recommendation has been made, health and social care must respond in writing within five weeks, setting out the steps they will take, or if they've decided they won't follow the recommendation, why they have made that decision. This new power includes all health commissioning bodies. So there really is a very strong need now for CCGs to work together with their more specialised commissioning colleagues. To support parents, carers, young people, and indeed professionals in understanding more about the new single route of redress, we have introduced a fairly extensive support package. This includes a guidance document aimed at education, health and social care professionals, but also accessible for parents and young people. There is a toolkit which does include frequently asked questions, webinars and newsletters. There is an ongoing support system through a help desk that we've set up. And there you see the email address for contacting the help desk. This runs alongside newsletters and webinars. And finally, our information advice and support services, which are available in every local area, and voluntary sector organisations can provide support to families by providing them with information about the trial. They can support the preparation of your cases. They can even support at hearings. They can signpost you to mediation and further support. My name is Chris Rees. I work for the Information Advice and Support Service Network based at the Council for Disabled Children. And I'll just go over very quickly um, some support you should be expecting to receive from Information Advice and Support Services. If parents or young people require further information, support or advice, they should contact their local Information Advice and Support Service, sometimes known as IAS or SENDIAS, which can provide impartial advice about resolving disagreements, appealing to the tribunal, the law on SEN and local SEN arrangements. The service can also help parents and young people prepare for meetings with the school, local authority or other agencies, including the tribunal. Parents and young people can find the contact details for their local service through this web link. There is also a separate website for children and young people who have SEND to help them understand what rights they have for accessing information, advice and support across education, health and social care. The website also contains full contact details for information, advice and support services across England. Information, advice and support services can support parents and young people during the national trial by providing information on the trial and the rights of parents and young people, by providing support with managing appeals, which can include preparing cases and attendance at hearings, and signposting to mediation and further support. In addition, you can find some additional support from the tribunal service by following this link and the local offer by following this link. There are also a range of other voluntary sector organisations that can help parents and young people with preparing for and attending the tribunal, including IPSI, SOS SEN and the National Autistic Society. Parents and young people should contact their local information advice and support service to find out more.
The guidance document has got a set of requirements and expectations for the various bodies, including local authorities, health and social care commissioners. It includes information about the tribunal's appeal process itself and has a list of the support available and routes for getting further information. It describes the implications of not following any recommendations arising from a hearing. And finally, it also describes in some detail the role of the research and evaluation team. The toolkit includes that guidance document. It also includes a summary for commissioners and parents and young people. The toolkit has provided some sample wording for local authorities to use as the basis for the information they are required to put on their local offers. Decision letters need to include information about the trial and we've included a sample of a decision letter. We also have included a sample letter for drafting responses to recommendations made. The frequently asked questions document will be found in this toolkit. There is also the expense form and grant agreement template for local authorities. There is a link to the regulations and finally there is further information and advice. As we've indicated, we are looking for an extensive evaluation of this new process. So we have commissioned an independent evaluation team. This evaluation will help us decide whether to continue with these extended powers. The evaluation will cover how well the new duties are implemented and whether there are any significant challenges around that. We'll also be looking for detail about what are the benefits for families, what are the benefits for agencies. We also need to get an understanding from all those parties about their satisfaction with the process, as well as a, an understanding of the economic and cost issues associated with this new responsibility. As part of the evaluation, there will be a number of telephone and online interviews with parents and young people. Twelve local areas have been selected as in-depth case studies, so the evaluation team will be spending quite some time looking in depth at the issues around the trial in those 12 areas. However, all local authorities and all CCGs will have an opportunity to provide feedback through an online annual survey. And finally, there will be an analysis of the responses to recommendations made by the tribunal. So the report will synthesize and analyze all of these issues and eventually lead to an evaluation report that sums up their findings. We are expecting there to be a research brief published eventually and some good practice arising. But ultimately, this evaluation will help government decide whether the new single right of redress is a new process that should be introduced um, on the statute book. Thank you.